they might believe that. Just think, all over the world, billions of people this day are singing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That one event has created a movement that's been going on for 2,000 years and counting. That, that one event has amassed followers of over 2 billion and growing. And we're going to focus on the importance of that event this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Join us next week. We're going to head back to Luke volume 2, which is also known as the book of Acts. So the last several weeks we've been in Luke volume 1, which is the gospel of Luke. Very well-known passage on the resurrection. As I alluded to the movement that the resurrection of Christ uh, has created, I was reading in Forbes magazine uh, this past week. Now, Forbes is not a Christian magazine. It's, it's a business magazine. It has articles on uh, executive leadership, uh, technology, information, those kinds of things, finances. But the article caught my eye. The title was, The Greatest Leader in the World. And the article said the greatest leader in the world was Jesus of Nazareth. I was floored. The conclusion was, regardless of your religious beliefs, as you, as you look at a 2,000-year-old movement made up of over 2 billion people, clearly Jesus was an incredible leader. Well, he was a lot more than that. And the question that I ask is, why aren't there more followers of Jesus Christ. And the secondary question is, for those of us who say we do follow Jesus, why don't we follow him more completely? Well, I've got a short answer for you this morning. The short answer as to why we don't follow Jesus more completely is because we're looking for life in all the wrong places. For those of you who are new here and don't know me, uh, I am a music freak. I love, ev well, almost every kind of music, uh, from, from Bach to rock. Uh, one genre that I struggle with a little bit um, is country music. But my, my sweet bride over our 34 years is slowly getting me to embrace some of it which is important to this morning's message. In 1980, an artist named Johnny Lee released a hit song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Had a pretty good beat, sort of toe-tapping, hand-clapping kind of thing. But the lyrics also really resonated with people because most in the world can relate to an experience of looking for love in all the wrong places. It went to number one, obviously, in the country charts. It went to number five in the Billboard Top 100. I even remember it. There isn't a song about looking for life in all the wrong places. But it's actually sheet music that we tend to live off of very often. Ponce de Leon looking for life in the fountain of youth. And the fact is, most of us look for life in those places as well. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with wanting to maintain good health or working out, but America and other places around the world, we've taken beauty to an almost idolatrous level. And we're looking for life in that or there's the search for the Holy Grail, supposedly the chalice that Jesus passed around at the Last Supper. And that if you find it and drink out of it, all of your material wishes will be granted. Now, clearly there's nothing wrong with material possessions necessarily, but if we try to 
if we try to look for life out of money and possessions, we're looking in all the wrong places. In our passage this morning, Luke 24, all the characters happen to be looking for life, just like us, in the wrong places. And in the passage as well, we find out where to find life. Let's all stand out of reverence for God's Word. Follow along as I read Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. This is God's Word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. And dear people of God gathered here on Easter Sunday. This is God's Word, and He gave it to us because He wants us to find life. Your deepest longing to feel alive, God gave that to you, and He has every intention of letting you know how He's going to fill it. Let's pray. God, we all long for life. We all long to feel alive. Sometimes we're dry, sometimes we're bored, sometimes we feel like we're dying, but we all want to feel alive. We all want to come alive. And so, Holy Spirit, do that in us even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Where do you look for life? We all look for life somewhere. We're all looking for life in something. What do you think about most of the time? What are you most worried about? What makes you angry if you don't get it? What makes you fearful if it's threatened? I promise you, those are the things you're looking to for life. Look at verse 5. The angel said to the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? We all have a tendency to do that, to pick through the bones of the graveyard of this world thinking that there's where we're going to find life. But we don't find life in a graveyard. We don't really find life in the things this world offers. We find life in the risen Christ. Augustine, in his book, The Confessions, at the very beginning, wrote these words. You made us with yourself as our goal, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We live in a restless world. We live in a world where people are looking to find their rest in things other than God. And all of us, some of the time, tend to do that. We'll only find life in the risen Christ. How do we do that? 
three ways that flaw to the text. First of all, look for life in the promises of the risen Christ. Why do you seek the living among the dead? You need to realize that's actually a gentle rebuke. These women should have remembered the promises of Jesus from before. The next verse reveals that they should have remembered. Verse 6, remember how he told you. The angels are encouraging the women. He told you this. Remember the promise. What was the promise? Verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered, be crucified, and on the third day rise. The promise of the resurrection had already been given to them. And when we forget the promises of the risen Christ, we get involved in all kinds of extraneous details of life that actually end up stealing life rather than giving life. In verse 1, we find that the women had been busy preparing spices, ointments, oils, aromatics to bring and anoint the body of Jesus with. And then we learned that they got up really early. And then they carried these spices and oils and aromatics. It was all for naught. If they'd have remembered the promises of Christ, they wouldn't have engaged in unnecessary activities. We learn in the Gospel of Mark that on the way they were talking among themselves, who's going to move the stone? See, when we forget the promises of Christ, we start entertaining worries that are never going to come about. So let me ask you, how are you engaged in unnecessary activities today? Simply because you're not remembering the promises of God. How are you engaged in carrying burdens you were never called to bear simply because you're not remembering the promises of the risen Christ? How are you eaten up with worry today simply because you're failing to remember the promises of the risen Christ? In verse 8, they remembered his words. The light bulb went on. And we learn in Matthew 28 that when the light bulb went on, they ran to tell the disciples. That's interesting. They ran. They couldn't wait to get there. You've been so excited, you just started running. And the text says they were filled with joy and awe. Are you lacking joy and awe and wonder in your life today? Could it be it's because you're not looking for life and the promises of the risen Christ? Most of us here probably know that the Bible is the highest selling book of all time. But I wonder how many of us here know the second highest selling book, at least in English, of all time. It's Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's an allegory of the Christian life. Uh, anything that we face as believers who follow Christ Somehow, by God's mercies, Bunyan was able to put into a book and use allegories that draw us into a story that we're able to learn about the grace and freedom and wonder of life in Christ. In one of the stories, one of the chapters, the main character whose name's Christian, he's on Main Highway, the narrow way, right? He's on Main Highway to Celestial City, to heaven. But he sees another way that looks like it might offer him an easier way. There's another way where it looks like there might be life there. So he leaves the main highway and takes a side road. It's, it's the perfect picture of how so often we are looking for life in the wrong places, even if we know Christ. Well, that shortcut, actually ends up leading Christian to Doubting Castle. And the owner of that castle is a giant. His name is Giant Despair. And Giant Despair wraps Christian up in chains and throws him in a cell and begins taunting him. You will never leave. 
you will never be free. You will never get out of here. You might as well just give up. He even says, you might as well just take your own life. It seemed for a season that giant despair was actually conquering Christian. Christian then spends some moments in prayer and reflection. And Bunyan writes, Christian is speaking these words. What a fool I am to lie here in this stinking dungeon when I can be free. I have a key in my heart called promise that will, I am persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. So we brought it out and the prison gates flew open. Now you need to realize for Bunyan, even though he wrote a true story of the Christian life for every man and every woman, Bunyan didn't just write things from a theoretical perspective. He lived a life of suffering. He himself was chained in prison for 12 long, hard years for nothing but preaching the gospel. When he was 15, his mother and his sister died within four weeks of each other. Historians say that Bunyan probably had post-traumatic stress syndrome from a really difficult, violent time serving in the military. His beloved oldest daughter was born blind, and it caused great anguish for John Bunyan. He so longed for her blindness to not get in the way of her loving Christ and believing that he was good. And it was the promises of the risen Christ that gave John Bunyan hope and enabled him to write a book that has ministered to hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions upon millions of Christians over the years. So what's your prison this morning? Where do you feel locked up? Where do you feel chained and you have for years and nothing seems to loose them? Is it a prison of despair? Is it a prison of some repeating sin? Is it a prison of someone else's making? Is it a prison of regret? A prison of financial worry? A prison of emotional struggle? I don't know what it is, but I've got my prisons too, folks. As a matter of fact, I've felt pretty locked up recently myself. So last week, I took a couple days, went through the whole Bible. I mean, I didn't read every page, but I went from Genesis to Revelation, just flipping the pages, looking for passages over the past that God has really spoken to me through. And I wrote down 15 pages of promises. And now I've been just going through them over and over and over because the promises of God are the key that unlocks any prison you're in. What are you going to do to remember the promises this week? When you read the Bible, write down promises somewhere. Record them on your phone. Whatever. Record the promises of God. Write them down on a three-by-five card. Put it in your dashboard. Put it on a mirror where you put on your makeup or you shave. But, but whatever it takes, start looking for life in the promises of the risen Christ. Secondly, look for life in the person of of the risen Christ. Verse 5, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is a living person. 
Listen, this is what makes all the difference in the world. This is why I'm a Christian. I don't follow the Jewish religion. Why? Because Abraham is dead. David is dead and in his grave. Peter speaks in this Pentecost sermon that that David is decaying in the grave. Even though he said, you will not abandon my soul, I will not decay in the grave. And Peter says, David's not talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus. So I'm not a Jew because their religious leaders are dead. I'm not a Muslim. Why? Because Muhammad is dead. I'm a Christian for one reason, folks. And that's because Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, we can have a relationship. He's knowable. He's personal. And he longs to be known. Do you realize that? I want you to think right now of your best friend. I don't know who it is. Could be a spouse. Could be a friend of the same age and sex. I don't know. Who's your best friend? Now, Think for a moment, how did they come to be your best friend? Right? You spent time together. You got to know each other's characteristics. There's a chemistry there. Why do you think the women got up extra early to go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus? They loved him. Why did they love him? He was a real person. He was their best friend. There was chemistry there. They got to know him. They got to watch him. They got to listen to him. They got to ask him questions. They saw how kind he was to people. They saw how wise he was. And everything, like that song we sang this morning, everything made him attractive. Everything made him beautiful. Everything made him wonderful. And then when they discovered that Jesus rose from the dead, they realized even after the, the ascension, he was still with them. He was an invisible best friend. I, I try to get Christians to think about this. We, we make the Christian life about behaviors or about doctrine. Look, when you read the Bible, folks, it is not... An instruction manual. Can I say that more forcefully? The Bible, contrary to almost universal opinion, is not an instruction manual. It is not primarily given to tell us what we're supposed to do. You know what? There's actually not much very unique about the Christian scriptures when it comes to behaviors. There, there's a few things But most religious books have a lot of the same stuff. Be good. Live with high character. Try to love people. No. The Bible's not an instruction manual. The Bible is a love letter. And when you read the Bible, you're not always supposed to be looking for how-tos. There's a place for that. But when you read the Bible, you're trying to get to know the lover of your soul. All through this text, we find out things about Jesus. Look at verse 7. He's called the Son of Man. You realize that's Jesus' favorite self-designation? He referred to himself as the Son of Man more than anything else. In the Son of Man, Jesus is saying, I identify with you in your humanity. I'm your friend, I'm your helper, I'm your teacher, I'm your sympathetic high priest. I've been tempted in everything that that you're tempted in, only I didn't give in, and I'm there to help you. I understand. When you fail, I won't leave you. I'll stand next to you. The Son of Man, though, is also from Daniel, the book of Daniel chapter 7, and it's talking about the ruler of God, and so some of the sovereignty of God as well. So your friend is not only closer than a brother, your friend Jesus, who's invisible, but is still there with you at all times, is always in control of every detail of your life. Your life is never careening out of control. Jesus is in control. In verse 2, 
The women come and they find the stone rolled away. Let me ask you a question. Why was the stone rolled away? We learn in another gospel that when Jesus appears to the disciples again, he just goes right through a door. He didn't open, he didn't knock. Then why couldn't he just go through a stone? Of course he could go through a stone. So why was the stone moved? Not so Christ could get out, but so the women could look in. What kindness, what patience, what grace. The women should have remembered the promises. They didn't. But they still moved the stone. Jesus still moved the stone to say, hey, even though you forgot the promises, I'm trying to give you clues. I love you and I'm alive. In verse 12, the grave clothes are laying there when Peter looks in. Why didn't Jesus just take the grave clothes when he rose? Because he's a God of grace, a God of kindness, a God of patience. And he wanted to give Peter hope and help. In verse 4, the women were perplexed. They were confused. And so Christ sent two angels to them. What a good friend. Think about friends that are like this to you, who are kind, who are good, who actually make you feel strong when you feel weak. Jesus is all those things. And he doesn't want to just tell you things you're supposed to do. He actually wants you to love him. And he actually wants you to experience his love. We just had a full moon last night. I went out, I was letting the dogs out last night, and I looked up, and there it was. Now, I don't know about you, but crazy things go on in my brain. And sometimes I look up, and I see them, and I thought, there have been people up there. I mean, not like the man in the moon. I'm talking about we actually sent people to the moon, right? And I'm thinking, that is just crazy that we've been on the moon. I was reminded this past week that uh, Apollo 11, which was the first uh, manned, uh, Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, that occurred on a Sunday. July 20th, 1969, was a Sunday. And one of the men was a Christian, Buzz Aldrin. And he had snuck on a communion kit onto the uh, module. And uh, he asked for a blackout for privacy, and he read John 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And he talked about how having intimacy with Jesus Christ was the most important thing of being a Christian. And he wanted to have communion on the moon uh, because it just revealed that no matter where we go, what we go through, where we are, what time it is, Jesus is always there, and he had communion on the moon. Now, how cool would that be? But the point is, Jesus wants us to love him as a person. We're looking for life in all the wrong places. Some of us are looking for life in religion. Some of us are looking for life in performing religious duties and being religiously devoted and Jesus says I want your love how can you develop your love relationship with Christ listen I'm going to let you into some of my craziness here I try to practice the presence of Jesus no matter what I'm doing I had the privilege of playing golf yesterday with some friends I actually play golf with Jesus. He gets really frustrated with me. But, uh, but I do, okay? I love to cook. I actually practice the presence of Jesus as I cook. I, I'm trying to all the time invite in my invisible friend who is actually more present than any foursome I'm with playing golf and more present than anybody I'm talking to while I'm cooking dinner. Folks, that's what it means to walk with Jesus. Look for life in the presence, in the person of Christ, in the promises of Christ. And then thirdly and finally and quickly, look for life in the peace of the risen Christ. Uh, the gospel of peace is the good news. Listen, people are looking everywhere for life because they're looking everywhere for peace. That's what life is for most people. It's just that, that feeling that everything's okay, 
that I'm going to be okay, that I'm going to be safe and comfortable. The problem is we're looking for peace in all the wrong places as well. People are looking for peace within, but peace within is only going to result from understanding you have peace with God. People are looking for peace in their homes, in their marriages, with their children, and that's a great longing. But the only hope for that is if all the parties involved understand they have peace with God. We want peace among the nations. It's never going to happen unless people enter into peace with God. Now, Luke does an interesting thing in this gospel account. Luke makes a comparison and a contrast between two individuals. One person is named, the other person is implied. Do you know who they are? Look at verse 11. The women came and told all these things to the eleven. The eleven. You know what it's been the entire time in Luke? The twelve. The twelve. The twelve. Why is it the eleven? The implied name there is Judas is missing. Judas, who failed in his friendship with Jesus by betraying him. But then in the very next verse, Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Peter also failed in his friendship with Jesus. Luke presents two failures, and they dealt with their failures completely differently. Judas was looking for life in his own performance. Judas was looking for life in his own success, and when he failed, it devastated him. Judas wasn't willing to look for life in the peace of the risen Christ. And filled with remorse, filled with regret over his failure, he fell into hopelessness and he took his own life. Peter, on the other hand, failed just as greatly. Peter wept, he was broken but he never lost hope. And when he ran, it shows I still have hope. Maybe God's not done with me. When he saw those cloths, he marveled. Oh my, it's really true. Jesus will forgive a cowardly wretch like me. You know, the Bible never sanitizes the Bible characters. Do you realize that? Too often, one one thing, I love, okay, I love biographies, but I'll tell you, there's one thing about missionary biographies that I don't like. They're all sanitized. Those people are not that good. I promise you. Anybody ever done a biography on me? They're going to know. I'm not anywhere good as people might. Well, I tell you everything anyway, so you know better. The Bible, I mean, Abraham was a liar. Do you realize that? Moses had an anger issue. Gideon was a fraidy cat. I mean, I can just, David was an adulterer and a murderer. We all fail, folks. Maybe you failed this week. Maybe you failed spiritually. Maybe you've failed morally. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home, but you've been not really walking with God. Okay. Who are you going to be? You're going to be Judas and just be filled with guilt and shame and remorse and lick your wounds for a lifetime and never move on? Or are you going to be like Peter? I think every morning Peter got up, he heard a crow, a cock crow, reminded him I used to think of his denial. But I think as Peter got older, every time he heard the rooster crow, he thought of looking for life 
in the peace of the risen Christ. Look for life in the promises. Look for life in a personal relationship of intimacy. Look for life in the peace that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings. Let's pray. Father, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Jesus, or again, as I started out, Lord, if there's someone here that they say they follow Christ, but Lord, honestly, they know, you know, they're not really all in. God, show us that there's life only in Jesus. God, open our eyes to see the wonder of the death of Christ for our sin and the life of Christ for our acceptance. And then, Lord, please make Jesus beautiful to us. Make us long for him. When we open the Bible, help us to see your beauty and your wonder and your power. And God, may each one of us leave today experiencing more peace because we've reminded, been reminded of what Jesus did for us. And then help us spread that peace to our neighbor, to our city, to our world. In Jesus' name, amen.